What's up, everybody? TJ here. Real quick before we get started with the episode, I'm testing out a new feature called Fan Mail, which is where you can actually text me from the episode that you're listening to. So as you're listening to this, go over to the episode description and right there at the beginning, you're going to see some text that says, send me a text message. Go ahead, click that. Let me know what you think about the podcast so far. Let me know of any questions, concerns, anything you might have. I love to hear from you. So go ahead, hit that up. I'm excited to read your text and let's get started with the episode. Hey guys, before we dive into this episode, I wanted to make sure you knew about our Patreon community. This is an online community where we help you grow into a tougher, faster, more aggressive firefighter with specific action plans designed to make you more resilient and well-rounded. The awesome thing about this community is that as soon as you join, we'll set you up with exactly what you need to grow as a firefighter. You'll get a workout every day that you can do with your crew or by yourself. We'll have a weekly growth mindset meditation to make sure your mind is ready for the strains of the job. And you can use our recovery exercises to take care of your body to make sure you have a long fire service career. We've been able to create amazing success for our members, like our friend Connor, who beat all his PRs in less than a month while still maintaining a strong cardio base. Or Ethan, who's gained a new perspective on the fire service while finishing his probationary period. And members like Chris, who learn a better way to balance work and life outside the firehouse. To check out the membership and learn more, head over to joinkeepthepromise.com. Again, that's joinkeepthepromise.com. And as a podcast listener, we have a special offer for you. When you sign up for a yearly membership, you get two months free. That's actually the maximum patron allows me to give you for free. So have at it. I can't wait to see you there. Now let's jump into the episode. So when somebody new comes in the door and they're wide-eyed and they want to ask you a million questions, remember you were that guy at one time. Don't talk about them. Don't shun them. That's our next brotherhood. Welcome to the Keep the Promise podcast, where we help build resilient and well-rounded firefighters. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, TJ. And today I have the distinct honor, the pleasure, and the great luck of interviewing a literally good old friend of mine. I have here with me Barrett Pittman, whom I met back in 2016 at one of those geeky, nerdy hazmat training classes in the middle of nowhere, Colorado. And today I get to pick his brain. He just happened to be at the National Fire Academy and I text him. I said, let's record. I want to, I want to hear your story. I want everybody to hear your story. And being the good man that he is, he agreed. So Barrett, welcome to the Keep the Promise podcast. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. I told TJ kind of leading up to this as, as fast as I could put it on my bucket list, I'll be able to take it off. Listening to other fire department podcasts, one day I'd like to say I did that in my, my career in the fire service. And, uh, within a couple hours time, we, we accomplished that. Yeah. Here you are. So it's yeah, awesome, who, isn't it? Who, who would have thought, you know, seven years ago, uh, you know, I said at the Certsy training center in Pueblo, Colorado, that, you know, all, all this would connect the dots and, you know, lifelong friendships, uh, still to this day oh, exist man. between it's just, and it kind of goes with the brotherhood of the fire service. Um, something I've tried to explain to my wife, but until you're in this brotherhood, you know, people don't understand it. People don't get it. And, and it's, it's funny because we will go months and sometimes years without speaking. And this is going to relate to so many people, but then we pick up like we were still hung over at Denver international, <laughs> trying to make our way home after a week long, just yeah. day of debauchery. Yeah. It's absolutely it's it's been a good ride so far. And we're definitely going to to go into how we met, where where we met and, and some of the characters because they definitely hell, they deserve yeah, their they, own they, episode. Yeah, they, they uh feel like they deserve their recognition here. Oh, absolutely. Without them, I, I feel like we uh none of this would have all panned out and happened. And dude, before I forget, you are one of the first supporters of Keep the Promise before it was its own entity back mm. when i used to sell the apparel and the, the stickers and everything through, through tj leather you and your crew were yeah there's immediately they're, uh, they're asking they're still asking 
uh, are they are they available? And if so, where can we purchase? And now that uh, like I, I say probably wear that hoodie because of what your statement was for that, you know, keep the promise. And, you know, as firemen, we're, we're trusted, um, you know, for someone to call in their deepest, darkest hour, um, has no idea who we are. And when our crews go through that door, whether it's through a working house fire to do a search or uh, a loved one has gone into cardiac arrest or whatever it is, they're trusting us to come in and, and, you know, we'll, we'll kind of touch on some of those other things, but later in the, in the podcast here, but you know, they're, we we're given that and it's, we need to keep that promise. Um, I feel like it kind of gets exploited at times um, through so many different avenues that it, it's kind of bringing us, bring the brotherhood back uh, for, for, you know, the, some of the, I guess the departments that feel like they have lost that are it's slipping away. And I, you know, we, we need to bring that back. We need to be that voice to bring the brotherhood back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's humbling that, that you feel that this venture is, is doing that because it, it was one of the goals to, to basically create that fire service that I always envisioned in my head. Mm. And then going back to your folks that are asking about when all the swag is going to be around, I, yeah, the online uh, store is going to go live here soon. So, they're. Uh, I appreciate their uh, patience. I, I I protect what I have of of uh, keep the promise, just in case. Uh, yeah, you got to put your lot, name on it, dude. You know, but I, I remember that that night when I first found the hoodies on the website, and we went to our crew, um, which you know we'll give them a shout out here in a little bit. But uh, you know, I think we ordered six hoodies that night from from yeah. Keep the Promise and. It's, it's, I, I wear it to work, to and from work. Uh, I, I bought the green. I like the hunt. So it's, uh, I've, I've worn it on hunts and just like I said, I, it's at the fire Academy now. I wore it here from New Orleans International all the way through Baltimore airport through the fire Academy last night. I got a lot of looks from it. And when I wear it locally to the Mississippi fire Academy or wherever I'm at, Hey, where can I get that? And what is that about? And it's being able, like I said, against sharing that story of, of keep the promise and what it's about. And so it's, it's, it's that advertising for, for us and you. Dude, you're pretty much like the first keep the promise ambassador. This is awesome. <laughs> this is giving me goosebumps. <laughs> so you're talking about your crew, right? You're, you're yes. kind of hinting as to geographically where you are. Just tell us like, what, tell us your story, <clears throat> where, where you're from, what do you do, where you work? So I work for, the the uh, the formal name of St. Tammany Fire District Number Four. Um, we kind of re- been rebranded uh, to Mandeville Fire and EMS. Uh, we're just north of New Orleans, by about 24 miles. You cross the the Causeway, longest bridge in the world of its type. Uh, we have a five station, about 120 employee department, um, four engines, a truck, uh, considered a heavy rescue. Uh, five ambulances and some other support vehicles. And <clears throat> I'm fortunate uh, to work with 10 of probably the, the best men that, you know, that I, I get to work with. Uh, I'm very fortunate for the crew that I have. Uh, my co-captain, you know, we're, we're kind of like the yin and yang. Uh, we, we have a lot of the same beliefs, even though we, we do a lot of things differently. Um, I, I have to give him some props. Um, and then, you know, just like every other you know, fire service there, you, you've got the captain and then we'll go down to the drivers or the operators. Um, those guys, you know, they're our next up and coming. So as an officer, as a captain, um, if I'm not training them to do my job, then I'm failing as a captain. I feel that, that's how I believe. I feel that way. That's how I was raised in the fire service um, from the two captains that I had. And just, you know, coming up, they made sure that you could do your job and then the job ahead of you. So coming on as a firefighter, they made sure that I owned that firefighter's position and then made sure that I knew my job or soon to be job as a driver, engineer, operator, you know, whatever classification you want, your department calls it. And it's the same thing as a, as a driver. I had 
influences as from other officers, like, hey, this is what you need. And and because I wanted to be that officer coming through the fire service, I saw officers that I did not want to be, um, which that can that's going to take us down a whole different path um, to some of the questions. But I was able to, you know, me decide who I, what kind of firefighter, driver, captain, and one day chief officer, what I want to be. That's, that's why we're here at the fire academy this week. You know, we're taking command and control um, just because that's, that's, I'm building my, my future and I can go back and pass that on to our crew. Um, and hopefully they pass it on and just, it's, it's contagious. And same with the firefighters. Um, I remember my first day I was hired in 2001, March 27, 2001, um, <clears throat> when I came in and kind of not so much the environment, but who I was around and influential people. And I hope that I can spread that positive, you know, you know, as far as the love of the job. And I think our crew can speak that, um, I'm a third generation fireman. Uh, my dad retired with 51 years on the job uh, as a as a fire chief. Um, but he's always, you know, I, I've been around the fire service my entire life. Uh, I just made 42. Um, but I, I've, like I said, been around the fire service my entire life. I knew pretty much this is what I wanted to do. I was either going to be a third generation fireman or a fourth generation mechanic. My family owned a mechanic shop, started in 1921. And so I kind of had either or direction to go to and um, just kind of one thing led to the next and start out as a volunteer at 18, I guess legally, and took an EMT class in Mandeville. I was late getting my civil service application in or my, my um, I had a test score, but was late to get my application into Mandeville. And I remember who I was met by a, the chief of EMS at the time and at, um, he was kind of rude to me. And uh, I went back to the tire shop where another gentleman uh, worked with us part time. I said, "Man, I'm not going to work for Mandeville." I said, "You know, this is rude. I've, I've heard bad things. Yeah, you know, I, I just that's not where I want to be." And uh, there was a guy in the 2001 class. Um, he was released from duty, and the fire chief met me after EMT school one day, and he said, "Hey, would you be interested in a job here?" And I said, "Yes, sir." You know, I said, "Uh." You know, and obviously my dad being a fire chief, he knew the fire chief. He knew, you know, you know, all the chiefs in the area. And um, he said, well, I'll tell you what, he said, let's uh, let's set you up an interview in a couple of days. I'll be in touch. And so I delivered my civil service score to him, um, filled out another application. And my interview lasted about five minutes and three questions. And I was hired on the spot. Didn't care um, what I made. It was I had a job in the fire service, an official career in the fire service. And from there, fast forward, I just made my, or fixing to make my 22nd year with Mandeville. And it's, uh, I not look back, um, you know, just like everybody, I've had my ups and my downs, um, been through some bad times in my life, just like anybody else. But for me, I leaned back into the job to the brothers that I work with, um, have and had worked with, and they've helped me get through those hard times. And, and right now I'm, I'm sailing on a high and I, and I keep going back to our crew. Um, you know, it, it's a shout out to the station 41A. Um, they, they like to be known as, as the truck sluts. And, uh, you know, we just, we, you know, we're around with the heavy rescue. Um, we're, we're ate up with the podcasts and, and watching, you know, stuff on YouTube and doing training of our own. Um, and we just found out kind of the other day that we're, we're beginning, our engine is replaced with our 70 foot, 75 foot stick. And so we will have two truck companies, which that kind of feeds their ego. Um, so you know, it's a, we get the best of both worlds, um, kind of, you know, between one day riding the Quint, which is to me is still a truck. It's a ladder. And let's, let's be real. Bro, that's blasphemy. And, uh, and then, and then. Two two days, you know, on, on the squad on a heavy rescue, and uh, that's that again. That just that feeds our ego. We, um, you know, I, I give a shout out to Patrick Gidry for kind of spearheading uh, our station shirts. Um, it's the pride of pride of old Mandeville, 
and that's that's what we serve and protect station 41 and we have a sticker a patch t-shirt kind of like each company you know you you want them to take ownership and the buy-in and that's again just going to some of your questions that i that i got it's you want your guys to have buy-in and make them feel wanted and i I feel that that's more of a productive end in the fire service um that that comes through experience that comes through classes but you really want you know i see guys show up to work at 659 and they're looking to leave at 601 and you know our our guys the latest guy gets there probably about 6.30, and our tour doesn't start till 7. We're 7, 7 a to 7A. And they've taken ownership because they want to be there. They love the job, and that's, you know, you surround yourself with that, and, you know, that it makes our our life easy. It, it's, you know, they are ate up with it, and that's that's what I want to surround myself with. I want somebody that wants to be there to do the job and and be a part of that brotherhood. I keep going back to something you said earlier that actually stuck in my head, that you had those mentors that made sure that you owned your position, but were also a useful part of the team. And I need to touch on a couple of things. Number one, how incredibly important it is to know what the other people in your crew are doing and what their responsibilities are. Because even though, you know, you're a medic, I might not know how to do medic stuff. I can at least support you as best as I can because I have taken the initiative to learn what your position is, to to kind of own it. And and you've said it a couple of times and it's it speaks volumes to the kind of firefighter that I know that you are, that you treat it as such. It's not just, hey, learn my position or understand what my job duties are. I need to own my spot. I need to own where I am. And we see that it's contagious to your people, right? Now you're subordinates, quote unquote, but you look at them more as your family, right? Mm -hmm. They own that. They own, we go back to Rick Lasky, pride and ownership. We go back to, to all these concepts of this is, this is a calling. This is a profession that, that we just love to do. And I think that that's very interesting how, how you look at it and how happy you were to get hired and and to get started in your fire service journey. And um, that's the that's a sentiment that, that I'm excited to be able to capture, to have the opportunity to talk about on this platform, because in a day and age where we are losing some of that, where we are seeing a bit of a decline in, in people's desire to join the fire department, to become volunteers, to to get that career. We, we see that decline. It is refreshing to see crews who get together and create their t-shirts, have their patches, that, that pride and ownership of their job and what they do, because that's what's going to carry generation after generation of the fire service. Think about it. And it's just like, it's just like the hoodies, you know, the, uh, we, I said five or six hoodies we sold that night or our boss, they sold, you know, and, I bought my chin strap from you. Well, then that again, hey, where'd you get that? Oh, shop PJ Leather. They went on. Um, now three or four guys um, ha- have bought chin straps. Um, I just got a text when I told two of them what I was doing this afternoon. Um, Matt said, "Hey, grab my radio strap while you're there." And uh, so I don't, I don't know if that's ready or not, but um, you know. It, and again, it, it's. They're they're spending their money for for a radio strap, a chin strap, um, because it's it, again it's taking. I feel that that's taking more pride into your job. You know, it just it, like everybody's turnout coat. You know, you've got a radio pocket. It's kind of that's like a standard issue kind of thing. Well, these guys, you know, they thrive on the. They met an FDNY guy in their hazmat chemistry class, and. And and it's been and I get it. I was in their shoes too, and still am. Um, you know, but FDNY uses radio straps, and you know, it, it's too much. To be and and I, I agree. But again, it just kind of goes to show for them, they are they're just ate up with it, and 
So it's, and and on the business end of things, right? It I've always kind of towed that line of whether is it a business dealing with customers or is it a business dealing with firefighters? Because to me, that makes a difference, right? I am my own customer pretty much. And it's important to realize that these items are going to go on calls or going to do things like I want to treat them, the customers as my crew. And I want to give them the best because, you know, we're not that different from each other. Louisiana, Maryland, right. West Coast, we're all New Mexico. Doing the same job. New yeah, Mexico. what up, Gabe? New Mexico. <laughs> well, that is a perfect segue. So <laughs> I'll start this, and we kind of have to bounce it off each other. But we met back in, it was leading up, it was a week leading up to Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. In beautiful Pueblo, Colorado. Yeah. Where you and I were for. Certes, what was it? Highway Emergency Response Special. Oh, yeah. I still remember that. Hers. Hers. That was, that was a wonderful class, right? Yeah. And what, what were you trying to learn at that point, right? We were doing... So I think we were, you know, like you said it best, we were all part of that that technical hazmat geek side of us, which is a whole different world in the fire service. Um, and I forgot how I even found out about Hers. I think one of my coworkers had gone and he knows my love of not so much all things hazmat, but definitely technical and technical rescue. He said, man, you really got to go take this HERS class. Um, you know, he kind of said, you know, that's, that's pretty much what he said. He's just go take it. He's kind of a, in his own way. But uh, I remember signing up and, and going, I went by myself, which, you know, for the listeners, don't think you know, getting into the fire service. I remember being 18 and going to our state fire academy at LSU. And I did a lot of stuff by myself. And I was kind of uh, very shy and quiet until you, I, it took me a little while to kind of warm up to, you know, to the, to, I guess, classmates. Um, and, you know, kind of once you, once I got the things going, you know, then it made class a lot easier. I've been at the fire academy up here in Maryland, uh, 2002, I went with seven guys. The next year in 2003, I came by myself. So it forces you to interact and that's how you network. Um, through this brotherhood and and then you know may of 16 you know we you and i sat shoulder to shoulder in hers and you know you kind of talk to the people that are around you in a class of 24 and you know you sat at my left shoulder josh durko sits at my right and brian and and rob sit in front and gabe was kind of behind between you and i on the on the next row and that was the circle you know, that was every night going to the Shamrock and uh, as as our instructor today says, the, the debrief. And that was our debrief, uh, you know, Monday through Friday. And uh, we still stay in touch, um, you know. And, and like I said, you know, it's been six years going on seven, you know, since I last saw you. And we, we picked up like it's nothing. Yep. And and Gabe, you know, Gabe's been to our ho- house I, you know, countless times now, uh, he was there for, um, at my wife and I's reveal party. Uh, he comes in once or twice a year to go hunt, uh, and, and in for, for a crawfish boil. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, that's where, uh, he proposed to his fiance was, was down. No kidding. Yeah. Was down at our place. And so I, again, May of 2016, I, you couldn't have scripted that. I've never imagined no. that. And now it's just, again, part of that networking brotherhood that that I, that I encourage you know go to classes yeah go to classes with your class you know with with your other other brothers from your department but also go by yourself and kind of don't be afraid to 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 branch out and because that that's how you learn more than just what the class offers but what other people are doing and then go back to your department be an advocate for that you know kind of we talked about the mental health thing earlier um before we before we went on and it, it's you know, from listening to, you know, previous podcasts and, and being able to be a voice in that, and there's no doubt that that our career needs that. And um, so, it, it again, it's just that networking, yeah. something you can just hear, uh, you know, whether you're whether you're sharing beers after class or whatever it is, um, you know, you, you learn more than just what you came to learn in a class. Yeah, that networking side and and expanding upon that brotherhood is so 
incredibly important. And when some of the younger guys in our special ops team would be telling me, hey, I'm trying to go to Aniston or or Pueblo or Vegas to to take this class, but I'm trying to go, like, I don't want to go by myself. I don't want to go, I only want to go if I can get, like, a handful of the other guys. I'd say the same thing you said. I'm like, dude, just, just go. Hmm. Just, you have, number one, you have complete control of what image you project of your department, so you can make them look amazing. But most importantly, you are forced to interact with the other folks in those classes and you end up with lifelong friendships. I mean, after we left Pueblo, like a couple of weeks later, I ended up in, in Mercury for the, the Rad Nuke class. Shocker, that's where Brian and Rob yeah. work. And they gave me a behind the scenes tour of the firehouse. They were showing me maps. So I like, guess yeah, is Area 51. This is where the <laughs> guards are shooting at you if you get too close. Like stuff that I would have never gotten to experience and that my classmates never got to do because right. they didn't have those those networking. And it's one of the greatest things in the fire service is that brotherhood that it spans the world. Yeah. And I, I want to go back real quick right there where you said, you know, you're representing your department and and I, and I see it right within our department uh, and, and there's no perfect fire department for coast to coast. There's just not. Um, and, uh, unfortunately there are times where, you know, I get it. Management has to make a decision, right? Wrong and different. They have to make the decision. They have to move forward and it's not a popularity contest. But just remember when I say that, you know, don't go to class and put down on your department, you know, just remember your very first day, you know, you fought how excited you were to get on that department. And yeah, I, I don't have a rock star day every day I go to work. Um, and I get it. I'm an officer and I'm not trying to be a company man, but sounds like it. Yeah, it does. It does. So I'm trying to bring this back home. Uh, but just remember, man, you, you know, you are representing your department and how bad you fought to get there. And, um, you know, just, just think back to that. So when somebody new comes in the door and, and they're wide eyed and they want to ask you a million questions. Remember, you were that guy at one time. So don't don't talk about them. Don't shun them. You know, that's our next brotherhood. You're probably going to be that man's captain. He's going to be your driver. And so you want to take him under your wing, what you might think is aggravating or whatever it is. And you want to show him those ropes and make sure that, again, you know, just like you talk about. You might not be a paramedic, but how can I support a paramedic? Same thing on a technical rescue scene. You might not have trench rescue or confined space, but, you know, I want to make sure that you know, you know, what the things that we need, what our team is going to need to make this a success. And, and that's how we remember we're all in this together and not one man. You might be the one man hanging on into that rope or being lowered down into that vessel, but. Again, you're not the sole guy. It's your team, your crew that is doing that. You're doing it as a whole. And and I, I, that's, I guess that's where I feel so blessed is that our team, that's how we function. And, you know, we can take the worst job and turn it into the best because we're all sharing that load together. Um, so it, it's, you know, just, just think back on that whenever you're going. And sometimes going to these classes – it kind of might boost, you know, your, your, um, your, what you see as an outcome, you know, your, your negativity, it kind of gets you away from your department. You're with a, you know, new guys, again, that you're networking, you're meeting. And it's like, you know what, they got the same problem. So it's not just us here in Mandeville or it's not us here, you know, and, um, you know, whatever fire department you work for, it, it's, it's all over. So it's not just our department that's having the problems. It's, it's nationwide whether you're a small volunteer to fire department or as big as New York City. It's just on a grander scale. And so it's, it's all the same, you know. You mentioned a trench rescue, and you knew this was going to trigger my question. <laughs> Tell me about this iconic trench rescue with a picture that you sent in the group chat all those years ago. Because um, it sticks in my mind. I mean, it looked it looked wild, bro. So I'm uh, 2003... They had had some other members of our fire department. They had gone to trench rescue um, before I got hired on. And, um, you know, again, just 
being a lover of all things uh, technical rescue, I, I remember signing up and I had a couple of naysayers, you know, they really, some of the naysayers, they didn't believe in this kind of training and or training in general. They're like, you know, you're wasting your time. We're never, you're going to use it. You're never going to, uh, it's just all a waste. And I said, okay, well, I mean, that's your opinion, but I'm still going to go. And I applied. I went to basic trench rescue at LSU. It was a 40 hour week. And again, just how networking works. Um, shortly thereafter that class, I had a job interview or a job offer from them to work, uh, for LSU as an adjunct rescue instructor. Um, but so I, I took basic trench rescue, um, Loved it because it's it's construction, it's the fire service. Uh, I'm not a handyman by no means, but I, I like to get my hands dirty. And then they offered an advanced trench rescue, and a couple of us went and just really, you know, just kill that game. Um, in 2005, right before Katrina came through, uh, down especially in our in our first due district, they were redoing a two lane road, making it a five lane highway. And there was some massive um, drainage work, road work being done. We were able to say, hey, look, we approached the construction company, which asked not to be identified. Um, they donated some money towards the fire department. We bought equipment. We put it on our rig. Still had the naysayers. We're never going to use this. We're never going to use it. Y'all just, you're wasting time, money, effort. Um, I just gotten back from the FDNY uh, medical specialist conference. And we did some, we talked about crush syndrome and treatment and a lot of just how everything just kind of flowed right here. And within about a week or two, um, I was off duty and uh, one of my good friends, he's a district chief now, he was the captain on the rescue squad for the day. And he called and he said, hey, there's a trench collapse in Madisonville. I, I need you to come. And so... I kind of um, quickly shifted gears. Uh, I called my dad, you know, like I said, fire chief at the time. Um, we used his truck to get me there pretty quick. And on the way there, I started making phone calls to other members um, that that I knew had the training and were competent in this type of work. And, you know, we again, going back to if you're, if your crews don't know or don't have the certification or the training, at least let them know the equipment that they need. And so he was, um, this, again, we were running mutual aid to this call from Mandeville. So we had an ambulance, a chief, a district chief in our heavy rescue, which we carry, uh, four fin form panels and a pretty extensive array of the Paratech gray struts and walk pads and everything you need to, to initiate, you know, a two panel set to get started. And so I got there and I quickly, you know, put my harness on and I asked the chief, or I, I asked the, the district chief that was somewhat running the show, um, but more or less my friend on the, on the rescue, I said, Hey, we said, what do you need? He said, we, we need to move. He said, one guy's, there's two guys in a trench, one guy's pinned from the waist down and the other guy is probably dead. And so uh, they had already had one panel set. We had set a second panel. Um, I got down in there. Um, I established um, his IVs and I was calling for equipment. And again, it's part of our, you know, the fire service is you don't think, you know, just one direction. You, you need to, you know, be able to think outside of the box, especially when you get into tech rescue. And so I'm calling for a lot of things, and they're like, he's in cardiac. I was calling for an AED, and I knew our, our AED on rescue has a two lead where I can look at, you know, look at his heart because there's some certain things that I'm looking for for crush syndrome, like, you know, as far as treatment paths. And I said, hey, I, said, I need an AED, a roll of duct tape, and, and two large bore IV setups. And like, he's going into cardiac arrest. Said, no, no, just, just give me the stuff. Like, let's relax. And um, the guy was bent. He, he was facing away from me. Um, and so I, I taped the duct tape, the leads to him again, little, little tips and tricks I picked up from the FDNY's rescue medics and taped the AED leads to his back and nailed the AED to the fin form panel and, uh, could watch his rhythm and put two large bore IVs in him, gave him some oxygen and we started digging and, um, 
you know, he kept asking and I, I could see his friend, but he could not, or his coworker as well. And he kept asking me, you know, what about my friend? What about my friend? And I said, look, let, let's, let's focus on getting you out right now. Um, and it took us a little while. We, I rotated through, you know, I, I dug and dug and dug. And finally they said, look, you, you got to come out. Like we, you know, we, we have to start a work cycle. And so I came, they pulled me out, they put another crew in and they kept digging and kept digging and kept digging. And I rotated back in and he just, again, he kept asking. And so I'm now like, I didn't want to tell him that his friend is deceased because I, I, at that point, I feel like he's just like, he's going to give up himself. And so, um, I started talking to him and he's like, man, I just, I want to see my baby born. I want to see my baby born. And I said, all right. So and I said, now we really, we, we can't let this thing go south. I said, we, we, whatever it is, we, we have to get this man out of this hole and he needs to be able to see his baby born. That's, that's all I kept, you know, that was, that's all he's worried about, uh, obviously other than staying alive. And we, we finally got him dug out. We, we lowered a Stokes basket down on the uh, ground ladder and laced him in the basket. Well, I kind of, I went up ahead of him to kind of guide the basket up the beams. And when he, I kind of straddled the, somewhat straddled the ladder. And when he got, well, almost, we got almost face to face. And I said, Hey man, I said, you're going to see your baby born. And dude, he just started crying. And I said, I'll, I'll never forget that. Like that was, um, even post Katrina making a grab like that, you know, that moment that I had with that worker was, you know, for the naysayers that you'll never use this. Um, that was my fourth trench job in, you know, around our area. Um, and we made a difference. And unfortunately, like I said, his friend and coworker, you know, he, he didn't make it. And, um, so that, you know, naturally the, the news crews were out there, they took a million pictures and, just like any any moment in time, like they caught that, and it kind of it kind of took off. And as well, you know, I, I thought it was a pretty cool picture. I mean, I, you know, not to grandstand myself, but uh, uh, that's when I sent it to y'all. And that year, the one of the the uh, the Knights of Columbus, uh, they came to the fire the Mandeville, I guess chapter, I guess you could call it, came to the the fire chief and said, "Hey, like you know, we you need you to nominate a." Firefighter of the year and a paramedic of the year, and they they gave the firefighter of the year to my friend that was on the rescue, the captain of rescue. For he was put in the operations, um, he called the shots. You know he he knew what needed to be done. He knew who to contact, the competent person, the people that needed to be there. And I got nominated for paramedic of the year from my you know my treatment path and and everything that I had done for the man. And um, you know that was. Again, that 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 is the experience that you know. Again, here we are to tell about that. I, I would have never in a million years back two thousand three when I took that class that I would have been doing that in in two thousand and and seventeen. I think it was, and uh, you know, just just one of those crazy moments that you that you find yourself in. It's so awesome that you get to share that experience because. Seeing the picture, obviously it didn't capture everything that went down. But if you pay enough attention to those little things, you start realizing just how complex that incident was and how filthy and exhausting it must have been. And I mean, I and mentally, physically, um, you know, I'm from Louisiana, so it's, uh, you know, I think it was 90 degrees with a probably 100% humidity, which that's a different heat and all it's, you know, and all its own. And um, we kind of had, you know, time was not on our side, obviously for him and his injuries, you know, but it was already pre-disturbed soil. It's going to happen again, even though we had systems in place. Like, it's not a place to just hang out. And then uh, we have our afternoon thunderstorms, which can be pretty significant at times. And we, after we freed the, you know, the man from the hole, we made the decision to like, we have to stop efforts because the sun, the thunderstorm came through. Um, we did have a round of severe weather um, and, and we went back at it. And so it's. Uh, Just in the nick of time, man. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. You got him at the right time. Lots of highs and lows. 
on that call, on that incident, how do you recover from those? What's what's your um, treatment plan, if you will, for yourself? So for me personally, um, you know, like I shared, I, I enjoy the outdoors. I love to hunt. Um, depending on what kind of hunting you do, yeah, either you're sitting in a tree and it's just you and you can just let your mind roam. Um, you can kind of take life in. It's quiet. It's peaceful. You just think about a lot of things, life, family, the job, things that you've seen, um, you know, and then other th- other forms of hunting. I'm with coworkers. Uh, I'm, I'm with, you know, we just got back from a, an Arkansas trip with, you know, three of three other guys, you know, that, that I work with. Uh, two of them are on our crew. Um, and so it, it's being a part of that camaraderie and, and part of, you know, some of that outreach. Um, other than obviously it's fun, we're, you know, we're all together and doing it, but kind of more of as an outreach. Um, one of the guys that I, I felt like I could kind of, you know, he was just kind of recently went up, went through a, through a bad breakup with his girlfriend and uh, he's kind of a younger guy. And I just, I felt like I felt the, the need to, to reach out to him and say, Hey, look, you know, like let's, let's sign up, you know, get your money in, come on this hunt and, and let's, let's free your mind. Let's clear your mind. And I'm also trying to give him, um, kind of keep him busy. You know, he's, he's next up on the promotional list for, for operator, for driver. And so it's making, again, making sure that he can do his job. Uh, just, you know, unfortunately in the fire service, you know, you're, you're kind of set with minimum standards. And so, again, I don't believe in minimum standards. So it's going to making sure that he can do his job as a firefighter and definitely do his job as a soon to be driver. Um, but kind of circling back to the, that mental, mental, um, health and wellness. I, I really like to work out and, and hit the gym. Um, it seems like a, a great escape, a great release. Uh, my wife is aware of that. Um, mm-hmm. you know, she's an emergency room nurse. Um, so she sees the other half of what we see, you know, she gets the, you know, the, uh, whenever, whatever the, the ambulance crews bring in, she sees the other side of that, the other half of that. And I try not to bring work home, um, but she has been a huge supporter and a support group of mine. Um, you know, if it's if it's a bad call at work, um, whatever it is. And so I, you know, there was a coworker that he left us. He went to work for for New Orleans Fire, and then you know he, he ended up taking his own life. And it was still kind of a shock that night once we found out, and only to find out that you know, what we should have had wasn't there. And, um, I, my advice is, you know, don't, don't isolate yourself. Don't be alone unless, you know, even, even initially you know, the first couple of weeks, don't, don't, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. You're not going to be, that's, I can't say not discriminated. Um, you're not going to be There's singled not gonna be out. Stigma. Yeah. It, like it's okay. You know, it's, it's not, it's not meant for humans to see the things that we do. And so I, I suggest that, you know, don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't, don't, you know, it's okay to cry. Um, I, I don't care how tough you think you are. Um, there are some pretty humbling calls that I've seen that you can tell when, when a brother needs to be lifted, um, that, you know, you can offer. And if he wants to talk, he can talk. And if he doesn't, I'm not going to judge the man for it, but I wanted the man to know that I'm there. Um, he's not in this alone. And whatever it is that that brings you, I say, peace, you know, with, with you, if it's the gym, if it's the outdoors, if it's working on your car, if it's a construction project, whatever it is, and do it. Like, don't keep this bottled up. Don't isolate yourself because it's only going to destroy you from the inside uh, and potentially make a decision that you can't come back from. And, you know, and again, that's just, don't, don't put that on your brothers. There's, you know, you might fight every day you come to work. Um, but there's, you know, and I'll, I, I think of two guys right now, right off the head, part of our crew. And I say fight loosely, but they disagree on some things, but one of them went to help the other one on Christmas Eve at night to assemble his kid's swing set. And I'll never forget that. And, um, that was my. Um, he was my smoke diver partner and we'll, we'll talk about that later, but that right there just goes to, 
you know, we will do anything for our brothers. I don't think they, they, some people don't realize that. And so don't be ever be afraid to reach out to your brother because you don't know what he's struggling with as well. And so it might be a two for a win there. You get off your chest and he might get off his, what he needs to get off his chest and you both helped each other out. Hey friends, I want to take a quick moment to ask you to support the show by leaving a rating and a review on your favorite platform. Your support means the world to us and it helps spread the message to even more people. We've gotten thousands and thousands of listeners and those high ratings help our show become more discoverable, allowing us to reach even more listeners and make an even greater impact. So if you've enjoyed what you heard so far, please take a moment to leave a rating and a review. It only takes a few seconds and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. And now let's get back to the show. The unique part of what we do in the fire service, it's something that that you just kind of brought to light, is that we can go from damn near killing each other (laughs) over probably something ridiculously stupid to acting like nothing ever happened and helping each other out in a time of need or in a time of inconvenience. Oh, yeah. That that takes me back to many of my old memories from from some of my good friends at, at my old station where like I was legitimate and I'm like, this is I'm 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 gonna take his head off and I'm gonna bury him out back <laughs> on the hill. No one's ever gonna find him. And literally like a day later it's just, you know, we're back to normal yep. or he needed help with something at home or it's it's so unique and you think about it in the scope of the corporate world of the stuff that the normal quote unquote people Mm. do, you know, Karen from accounting is not going to help you set up your kid's swing set. The, you know, not at Christmas Eve. Yeah. Not after dark. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely not. not. And half of the stuff that we say, you know, Beth from HR is definitely going to get you canned for. It's, it's important to realize how, good we have it in this job because it it, we're just being our goofy selves and getting paid to do it oh yeah what what you know people that go to work say a construction worker or somebody that a a physical laborer that works say nine to five or sometimes longer you know they're the ones that are out working for our salary that you know they're paying for my uniform the benefits the, the 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 rigs that we ride in for me to be here at the National Fire Academy this week. You know, it's we we kind of sometimes not I say forget who we serve, but you know, we we kind of forget that. Like it's almost like a, not a surreal moment, but um you know, it's it's uh, important to realize yeah. that that we're here for them. Yeah. And that everything revolves around them ultimately. Yeah, and and I, some of the trend in the fire service, I feel like at times we, we often forget who we, who we there, what are we there for, and who we are. You know, we to serve them, um, you know, and that's, it's keeping that, not forgetting that. It's keeping that promise, just just like it, just like the logo says. You know, I keep going back to that, and. By you putting that on there with that logo is, I mean, it's huge. It's keep the promise, and on so many different levels, and you know that that's. I always relay that to our crew. It's don't forget, you know, what matters is those men, women, and children out there, and I'll point to the street. That's who we serve. They they come above all. It's not about going to do this pre-plan or this hydrant or this training it, it's where the rubber meets the road what we're here for and that's who we're serving let's rewind a little bit because this is something that i've been very curious about you mentioned one of the guys was your smoke diver partner mm-hmm. i have been curious about the whole smoke diver programs the culture for years because that is something that we here in the northeast have zero idea about we i the first one i saw was i think it was indiana smoke diver then i realized that there's one in georgia then you're like yeah i was in mississippi it's a it's a it's a kind of a grow i said not a growing trend but um i can give you more of the history of mississippi's only because it's a neighboring state 
Please do. Um, so the Mississippi Smoke Diver Program was started in 1976. Um, I, I don't know the exact person that started it, um, but my captain and several other guys on our crew at the time, they were smoke divers, um, and that has been set as a a um, personal goal of mine and a career goal. I knew I was going to go to tech rescue classes. I knew I was going to hazmat officer classes, and I was going to promote my way up. I knew, like in my head, I'd already had my career path, what I wanted to do. But for my, for me personally, um, you know, and that's kind of a side note. There is, if you're ge- first getting into the fire service and you're listening to this, set goals for yourself. I don't care how small or how hard they are, but set a goal and accomplish it, and then move on to the next one. Uh, and for me kind of young in my career and early in my career, I, I knew I, I wanted to be a paramedic. I wanted to be a smoke diver and I wanted to get my fire science degree. I knew those were like the three must haves. Um, 2007, I went to paramedic school um, with some of my really close friends. One of them is we sat at the same table with my best friend. Um, man stood at my wedding. Um, we went to paramedic school together. And um, 2011, you know, I'd signed up to Mississippi's program. When again, it was back when it was five days, and then they went to four 10-hour days. So it's it was basically, it's four days of hell. Um, and, uh, to, you know, to get into Mississippi's program, and again, I, I don't know what, you know, Georgia, Indiana, and I think Oklahoma um, all kind of are the same curriculum. It, Georgia is kind of what started the catalyst for the Indiana and Oklahoma. But for Mississippi... You know, it's a very um, sacred patch and belt buckle. And I said, I, you know, my captain wore the buckle. The guys, you know, that I worked with, they wore the buckle. And so I, I said, man, I just, I got to be a part of that. Um, very physically demanding class. And if you read, uh, if you read the, cl- the class description, it's an advanced firefighting course to, you know, preference on um, structure fire rescue and fire attack with inch and three quarter and two and a half inch attack lines. And it's very specific. And to get into the program, you know, day one, you have to run a mile and a half in less than 12 minutes. And the track at Mississippi Fire Academy, it's not just your flat track at your high school. Um, It's got a pretty good elevation change uh, from where you start at the top of the hill and you run down and you, you, you run up a pretty significant hill three times, just go around and around and around. Um, And for me, uh, I don't have the runner's build. I don't have the runner's body. I'm a 5'11", 210 pounds, pretty stocky build. Um, so I had to kind of get into running shape. When I say kind of, I had to get into running shape. So I had to do the mile and a half in less than 12 minutes. And these are all standards. You know, their motto is the standards are set or the goals are set. Um, will you measure up? So you had to do the mile and a half. You had to do seven straight arm pull-ups. Had to be perfect. 25 push-ups, 45 sit-ups, um, carry two interlocking sections of three inch up five stories and back down and then walk a balance beam. And that was just your buy-in. Um, you know, people are, are even unsuccessful on the pull-ups, the run, but it's listed in the course description. You know what you have to do. So I trained for nine months to go. Um, I overcame, when I first got into the fire service, I was pretty heavy and at my peak, in 2005, I weighed 296 pounds. When I went to smoke divers, I was 196 pounds and no question could do the physical assessment to get into the program. Um, uh, I had been training. I really didn't know who my partner was going to be. And about three or four weeks out, um, I got a phone call from my training chief and and another smoke diver and um, captain that at our same house, he said, Hey man, he said, um, you know, we, we had, a, we have an opening. You're the next, you know, the next guy that we think can go, you know, you should go to smoke divers. And it's a pretty nerve wracking class. And I, as in it's a mental, you know, it's a very mental class. It's probably more mental than physical, but it's just as physical. Don't, don't get me wrong. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm like, man, I don't know. I, you know, even I've been training for nine months and can do 10 pull-ups and, and run a mile and a half and, and 1030. I just, again, I didn't feel like I was ready. And they they pushed me to go. And about three weeks out, 
Um, they said, hey, your, your partner's going to be LJ, and LJ Smalls. And I had known LJ. I, I, I taught some of his academy. And I went to him that day. And my, you know, my wife was in a truck with me when I got the phone call. And she's like, no, you're going. Because we can't continue to live life like this. And she was a huge supporter of me uh, through this program. She knew how bad I wanted it. Um, so she was, hey, look, I, I'm willing to put our lives on hold for you to get this. Because I know you've told me what it means to you. So, okay, sign me up. Let's go. I'm, I'm going in February. February 2019. So after that, that day, I went to... LJ, we were on two separate stations at the time, two separate shifts. I said, hey, look, I said, um, I haven't told him yet. I hadn't called him because I wanted to tell him personally. And I said, uh, hey, that's a great news. I said, I'm going to smoke divers in February. He's like, really? I said, yeah. And I said, you're going to be my partner. And it's, I remember his face lit up. And I said, but hold on. I said, here's the deal. I said, you know, I'm only doing this once. And I said, I'm going to pass. And I said, I'm not going to quit on you. And you're not going to quit on me. And I said, we're going to have this understanding before we leave Mandeville. And he got very strict faced and he, and we shook hands and he said, you got it. And he said, we're going to do this together. And we might've trained a handful of days because it was pretty last minute. And he had been doing two a day workouts and he, he told me all of his training regimen. I said, that's great and all. I said, but I don't need you to quit. I said, we're going to go through this whole process, through this whole thing all week. We're going to be done and we're going to do it. And, uh, and there were two other guys, you know, poor guy, he, you know, another guy, he was on his third attempt. Um, the first day, first time he went, he, he, he passed out. They drug him out of the building. Second class, he went, he let the nerves get the best of him. He quit the third day. You know, he went with our or third time. He went with our class and he, again, he had to be medical out of the class. So we showed up Mississippi Fire Academy and, and you see a couple smoke divers and I'll never forget the support group. And again, he talks about that brotherhood, the support group from Mandeville that was there for us. And, and we went Sunday, kind of like a little orientation. And I remember Chad, uh, instructor Chad Martino at the time, they call him, you know, everybody called him Tina. But again, to be formal, it was instructor Martina because I didn't know Chad at the time. And I didn't know any of those guys my first time being on this campus. And I was in awe of the Mississippi Fire Academy's campus. And you think Mississippi, backwoods, rednecks, that's totally not the case. Um, very squared away fire academy, very squared away campus curriculum, the whole nine. And so Chad was looking to like ease some anxiety of the smoke diver program because it has only about a 20% pass rate. And our class started with 24 and only five of us passed. Um, so he, you know, he had an orientation, he had smoke divers come and talk. And then Monday morning, you know, we went in and everybody's, you could heard a pin drop because it's a very nerve wracking class probably one of my top three classes in my entire fire service career. And I've been in fire service for 24 years. And I remember instructor Russell McCullough came in and he had this very stoic face and he had his clipboard and he was a coordinator and he introduced himself, didn't crack a smile. He explained how the week was going to go. And uh, he said, all right, he looked at the clock. He said, it's 720. He said, in one minute, he said, each of you, he said, one at a time, you'll exit the exit that door. He said, you're going to come out and meet me by the pull-up bar. He said, every minute on the minute until everyone clears the classroom, you're going to come, you know, come out one at a time. And so I, I was kind of like the back two thirds of the class. And I knew I, pull ups were my nemesis. Um, we talked about 2011. I signed up, never could get past the fifth pull up. So I had to, I say, cowardly withdraw my application. And now this was my shot at it in 2019. So I remember going out there and my palms were sweaty. Not, not to sound like an Eminem song, but. Uh, <laughs> He was sitting there very stoic. He said, name. And I said, Pittman, Barrett. He said, I, I will need seven palms away chin-ups. Your chin must clear the bar. Begin when ready. So I remember jumping up there and said, here we go, Barrett. Like, this is it. Like, this is this is your shot. And the first three, four pull-ups, it came super easy. I'm like, man, this is it. I was on a high. And I did my seven pull-ups. And wow, that, I got it. And he said, go down, run, jog down the hill. You'll meet instructor Cook. He'll pass you through your next assessment. So I jogged down the hill just thinking, I got one out of the way. So I went, I, I met instructor Ross Cook, which you made a chin strap for him. He doesn't know yet. And uh, so he, he said, uh, he was a little more laid back. He said, all right, man. He said, look, you're going to walk this balance beam, pick up the hose, come back, set it down, move you on along. 
We knocked down the balance beam, went to another instructor, push up, sit ups, boom, did the run. Um, everything was set. I'm now I'm officially in Mississippi Smoke Divers class for 2019. Uh, you know, from that point on, you had to wear your mask, you had to tie your Swiss seat, and you had to wear your Swiss seat, Swiss seat with a carabiner and figure eight, and you jingled everywhere. And every time you came in and out of the certain door, you had to do seven pull ups every time you came in and out of it. Um, so that Monday afternoon, uh, they really shifted gears and you had five attempts. You had four evolutions, each carried five attempts. Um, our first evolution that afternoon was the box maze or the firefighter down, and it's the basement of their old heat building. And it was, you know, you heard, heard the stories of the box maze and the scuttle hole and dummy carry and all these things. And that was our first smoke diver evolution of Monday afternoon. And you had to follow, there were two charged hose lines, but they were very specific on the one you followed in. And you had to follow it through a, through a box maze of a ramp, rafters, floor joists, ups and downs into the basement to find a, probably a 250 pound firefighter with an SCBA on his back. And you had to get him out of the basement, back through the box maze, following the same hose and back out the door on 2,216 pounds of air. Wow. Well, I'm not a, um, I'm not the best on air consumption or uh, reserves. And so Ch instructor D. Martino was the, was our proctor for that. And we got him out, you know, everything in the fire service is technique. And we kind of talked about our technique, but not really, I guess. And it was more of us, let's handle the situation, what we're going to do. And, um, you know, LJ and I shot down to that basement because we knew we had to be quick about this. We only had 2,200 pounds of air, not, not your, you know, not modern day 4,500 pound cylinders. So limited air, we shot down the basement. Um, I, Girth hits the guy real quick with some webbing when we got him back through. Now, at this point, my bell had been ringing before we got him out of the box and uh, followed the hose line. We, we were successful. We got him out, and I, my, my ass was sucking to my face. And I remember Tina came up, and he undocked my regulator, and we never locked, left eyes. We locked eyes, and he just kind of looked squinted, looked at me, and he bled my regulator. And I had just a literally probably four breaths left. And he gave it back to me, he said, complete. He said, get your spare bottles, go to the control tower and tell them, complete, get out of my face. Wow. And that was a huge win for, for LJ and I right out of the gate. And then we had two fire evolutions, you know, a, I think a below, a below grade fire attack with, with search and rescue and then above grade search and rescue, no hose line. And um, I'm trying to think, of, there was one more evolution. Um, that afternoon. I mean, we can keep it secret that way. You're not giving away the whole program. No, so I'm, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, no, I, I, it's 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 all good. But um, you know, that was you know, like once I got through Monday with that, when I had that last C complete, I'm like, man, I, I made it to, to. I'm I'm going on the day two. It was huge. Um, not that I doubted myself because you don't want to doubt yourself. And next morning, you know, Tina. And another instructor, they we did PT. We ran a mile, mask, Swiss seat, the whole nine. Again, don't forget your pull-ups. And, um, you know, we started out with 60-second dress drills. And you start on line zero. You have less than 60 seconds to be fully donned out on air, your hands back in the ready position. And you had to do it three consecutive times. If you got to the second time going to the third and you were incomplete, you started back at line zero. And I was three and out like I was done. I owned that. I knew that going into it. And, and LJ was right there with me. Um, it pays to be a winner. It pays to be first. And so we were shotgunned to the the dummy carry. Again, another 250-pound dummy. Um, we didn't have any incompletes for the morning. And I'm thinking, man, I made it to lunch on day two. Um, that afternoon, and this is where, you know, your brothers come together. Um, that night, we had two more fire evolutions. Um, and we had, a, we ended the night on 150 ax chops and you're dead tired. You're exhausted. There's no skin left on your knees from doing surges and you're just exhausted. You're drained. Your gears significantly heavier because it's soaking wet now from the sweat and the water from the evolutions. And I'd done my 150 chops showed wood for instructor Durfee and, uh, LJ got up there and, and he was tired and he started his chops 
And we got up to about 140. He's 10 away from being done. And he started to kind of get sloppy with his chops. And uh, they brought him all the way back to 75. And it was a huge blow to him mentally. And so every time I would count 76, the instructor would count 75. He never would release him. He let him do another 20. Um, this is where, again, this is the same man that, that, that helped Matt put his kid's swing set together on Christmas Eve in the dark. Um, he's, as he's doing his ax chops, he said, I'm not going to make Barrett do this again. And so he, he, he stuck it out and he did an additional, an additional hundred chops. And finally we got off of that evolution. We were done for the night. I'm thinking, man, I'm like, this is, this is, this is crazy. I'm going to day three, smoke diver. Um, day three, you know, for those listening that have been there, you know what day three entails. Um, you start the morning again, PT. We had a trough fire, we had a pad fire, and that afternoon is is the dreaded scuttle hole. And it's uh you saw it on the third floor and um you know, you, you it's a search and rescue, but there's a hose line there, there's 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 a couple pieces of uh, equipment out there on the landing. So you go in, you go do your search, we found a victim. And and we knew what evolution it was that afternoon. And uh, we pull the first victim out. We go back down the stairs to be met by an instructor. And it says there's been a collapse. You have to find an alternate route. And so this is where the scuttle hole comes in. And um, I remember throwing the, the lid to the scuttle hole and looking down. And they had every fire prop raging in that building. It looked like the pits of hell. And so we shot the roof ladder down there and descended, you know, and to God knows how many degrees. And, um, you know, we did our search and we found another victim, got him up through. Now at this point, my bell started to ring. Um, the same, basically the same dummy, the 200 something pound dummy. He has to come through that hole as well. And I'm not going to tell you any trade secrets here, how to get him through there, but just know he's got to go up through that hole and he's got to get out of the building with everything that you brought in. First time I ran out of air, I had to be taken out of the building. Second time, um, we we couldn't get the guy up. I ran out of air, had to be taken out of the building. Now at this point, I'm exhausted. And my partner, LJ, is exhausted. Um, but again, this is what part of that program is to find your, when you hit that wall, is to overcome that wall and that adversity. And you know, now we're really starting to have to dig deep in ourselves. Like, hey, this is doable. There's a thousand other smoke divers ahead of us. They did it. We can do it. Um, so we, we dug in a little bit more and we got it on our third attempt. And it was a huge, we were totally, we were, we were exhausted. We were whipped. We still had three evolutions to go. Um, we went through the wormhole that afternoon and um, we did something else. And then the last one was the waterfall. And it's a flooded five story drill tower that you have to take a high rise pack to the fifth floor and knock over basically a cone outside. But there's some other trade secrets that I won't, again, won't let go. You just have to figure it out for yourself. I, I suggest you go to the program, but first time we, we destroyed it. Like it was horrible. Um, and I felt like I was circling the drain and it made me dig for me who, you know, what it, like I it, this was part of that personal goal. You're doing some self-reflection here. And um, I I had to dig deep, and I told LJ, I said, "Look, man, I said you're gonna you're gonna take this hose to the fifth floor. I said you're gonna make the connection, and I'm gonna do the rest." I said, "We're done for the night." And he's like, "Ah, I can't, I can't." I said, "No, this is what you're gonna do, and we're gonna be done for the night." And we finished with four minutes. You had to do it in less than five minutes. We finished at four fifty three. And as tired and as dead as we were, when we were done, I just had this this um, moving experience that um, I'll, I'll never forget. And all of a sudden, I've, I had this newfound energy. And some of the other guys, you know, they had completed it. Well, there was one more team, and they were struggling to get, you know, after day one, you had four attempts instead of five. And they were getting ready on their fourth attempt. And it was storm and rain and and I said, hey, I said, let's go out there and support our brothers. And so I remember we're getting ready to run out the door with our mask and our Swiss seats. And we were met by Instructor McCullough. And he says, where are you going? And I said, we're going to support our brothers. I said, this is their last run. And I said, we want to be there to try to support them. And he said, fair enough. 
and he stepped out of our way and we ran out there. And uh, I, tech, I kept time on my watch and they, they missed their time. And I just kind of shook my head and, and everybody, the, the other five that had passed or the other four that had passed kind of put their heads down like they didn't make it. And uh, Instructor McCullough came back up and he said, you can go ahead and go back in. He said, oh, we'll be with you all in a second. And so he said, congratulations, men. He said, you, can, you made it a day four smoke diver. And uh, he said, you know, square your gear away. Uh, we'll meet in a classroom, 7 a.m. Remember, if you're, on, uh, yeah, you're, yeah, if you're on time, you're late. And uh, we were knocked out day day four. And I remember the final evolution. And uh, when I was done, it was a very emotional experience for me because it was something what I had to overcome, losing 100 pounds, doing seven pull-ups, everything that I had fought to get there to do it. And I told my partner I was going to do it. And I upheld my end of that, and so did he. And so we have that that stronger bond and, and everybody in, in our firehouse. And I kind of read, well, that's, that's Barrett's boy. You're not going to, you know, that, that's him. But uh, we, we shared that together, that misery, that that victory just, and again, it's, um, I'm fortunate. I, I get to work with four other smoke divers. And so we've shared that together. And, but again, I've fought fires with guys that aren't smoke divers that do just as much work. Um, so I don't want to downplay those that aren't, please don't, don't take that. I'm no better than the next guy. Um, it, and it's more of a personal thing. If you, if it's, and it's not for everyone, but, I respect, you know, you, you go up there and you give it a shot and you're incomplete. You know, I, I still look at them the same. There's no disrespect there. It's, uh, but for me, that was a very huge rewarding thing in my career that I that said top three that, and I'm again, just talk networking. Now I go back part of the alumni, you know, instructor cook, uh, McCuller, um, Trimble, Durfee. Uh, there's just so many, you know, the guys that you get to network and talk to and and now we're passing, you know, keep the promise, you know, the, the, ch the chin strap, you know, that, that's just, just like that. You know, it's um, so many things. They, they saw the hoodie. I wore the hoodie up there on, on Monday for when they started. So they see that, you know, in hopes that, again, what, what, what this is about. And it's, again, more brotherhoods, more uh, relationships are formed and, I can call on those guys in Mississippi for anything, and uh, and same likewise. You know, they they when they see the guys from Mandeville, whether we have candidates in the class or not, they know like, hey, you know, we know what you guys are about. So that's awesome. That I don't know. I was I was getting stressed just listening to those <laughs> to those parts, and like my my palms were getting sweaty. I was like, oh god, the scuttle. Yeah. What changes did you see in your everyday life and, and at work after coming out as a smoke diver? I mean, you talk about that transformation from who you were like a decade prior to all, all the effort you, you had to put in. What was day one after being a, after becoming a smoke diver? What was that like? What, what changes took place? Like did, was it a whole new person? Were you just like, cool, I got a little diploma and a, and a patch and and I get to brag? and or, um, So, I mean, for me, I try to stay pretty low key. Um, I didn't really even know if you, you know, I'm wearing a smoke diver hoodie now, but it was to stay humble. Like I said, I, I'm no different. I'm no better than, you know, than the next guy that doesn't have it. Um, but... I knew after completing that training that how I should search a building, how I should advance a hose line. I know that I can push myself personally. I, I've been tested. I've hit my wall and I climbed over that wall and I know that it can be accomplished. And, and that's where you, you really, again, digging back, you know, into yourself. It's easy to quit and throw up your hands. And, you know, and I get it. If, if, if the, the program's not for you, it's not for you. But um, it, it was for me, it was now that I'm kind of expected to be able to push harder 
and push deeper into a fire and go back to where I potentially found a person and bring them out and go right back to there and continue my search until that entire building is clear. You know, if it's one bottle or if it's three, you don't stop because it's kind of that expectation now. Like that's, you're expected to search better, to fight fire better, to take more heat than the next guy because you, you know, pretty much anybody that goes, I was burned. My coworkers have been burned. Um, but it's, it's that it's not being able to quit because somebody is potentially in there. And that's part of the, the risk that we take of this job. It's, you know, we're going to have trouble if you tell me that I can't go in there um, or if I miss somebody, you know, I, it's not even talk, talking about if I miss someone, but if you're going to tell me that I can't enter that structure to search and I'm looking at a family that say my kids are on the second floor, I'm probably going to, I'm going to put myself in harm's way more so than normal to get to that floor or wherever it is to that room to at least give that family and that child that chance. Uh, that's kind of expected of me now. I feel that it is. So. And you have that experience of having pushed yourself to the breaking point and continuing on even past that point that you know when you get there and the family's staring at you, my kid's up there, you know that you can give. Yeah, you can push more. How, you, like the, everything. You you are capable of more than you can ever imagine. Um, and part of that program, you know, in my training was, uh, and I continued to spread that to the firefighters that I've assisted in training with. It's, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, get very um, personable with your mask, with your turnout gear. Um, you know, if, if, if you have mask anxiety, that's that's not the place for you. Um, you know, er every bit of training was done in my mask. Um, the countless miles, the pull-ups, the push-ups, it was all done in my, my SC, uh, yeah, MS, SCBA mask. And it's because that's, you live in that thing all week. You cannot take that off other than to eat and to sleep. That is it. I mean, everywhere you go on campus, that's how they keep up with the jingle of your eight figure eight and that mask. And so again, it, it's. We get comfortable with being uncomfortable, and that's how you help, part of helping you overcome that. You know, you can yeah make those pushes. Um, I dig it. I dig it. Like that mental aspect of being able to push so much and still being able to to continue the mission is critical, because echoing what you say, it's important to repeat that we are capable of so much more than we think. And the only way we can figure out how far we can go is to push that envelope and to push to that breaking point and figure out what the breaking point is. You might think that, you know, sucking down all 2216 is going to be a breaking point. You find out that you still have four breaths in, hmm. that you can go, you can go more. Now, you know, in the back of your mind, now they give you a 4,500 PSI cylinder, you're golden, right? You're set for life. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, and it's it's funny as that class teaches you how to push to your breaking point. Um, a couple other classes down the road, uh, we went to FIRST, which is another Mississippi offered class. It's a firefighter intervention, rescue, survival techniques. And basically it's, basically it's, it's now your, it's RIT training and uh, which kind of opened our eyes to that. And I went with another smoke diver and, for everything that they were teaching us, like, well, wait a minute, we're scratching our head. Like you just taught us to push to our max, to push our breaking point. Like, let's get the last little bit of air out of that 2216. But now you're telling me when my bell gets all, goes off that I need to exit the structure. And he's like, yeah, we can't really, uh, can't really explain that, but just, just go with us. Just, just trust us on this. And I said, I, I got it. And, um, you know, again, just, you know, I guess it, it all goes back to, you know, being physically fit for the job, you know, we kind of bring that back home. Um, you know, again, you, you think about your your day, you're, we're not making runs every hour on the hour. And so we have a lot of downtime and utilize that 
uh, and I'm not saying I'm goals gym here, but you know, for us, we, we have to work out, you know, minimum of an hour a day and, uh, you know, take advantage of that. It's good for your, obviously you have to have it for our job, but it's also good for your mental psyche. You know, you know, whether you're running outside, you run on a treadmill or Stairmaster or weights, CrossFit, whatever it is that you want to do, do something. And again, it, it helps you. You're going to have to make that push one night and, and you want to be physically fit to be able to do that. And again, like I said, I, I don't claim to be Mr. Mr. Jim here, but um, I, I do believe in that. And it's, it's good on, on many levels. All right. Now that we're starting to wrap up, what's the future hold for Mr. Pittman? Um, so I, I just recently finished my fire science degree again. That was some I'm, at the time or right now I'm currently uh, 100% on my personal and career goals. So it's time to set some new ones. Um, you know, being up here at the fire Academy, I'm, I'm with one of my good friends that, you know, he's an up and coming district chief as well. And uh, we're, we're tackling this whole command and control series. And so now one of my new goals is for me, I'd like to get all of the command and control classes under my belt and considering the managing officer certificate um, at, at, you know, at the fire Academy here. Um, I hope to take the district chief's test in about a year or so. Uh, even though I, I said I'm completely content with retiring in the right front seat, I like to be a work. I consider myself as a working officer. Um, you know, I love being a captain. I love the guys that I get to work with. You know, again, shout out the 41A. Um, those guys, they make my job easy. They make it hard. Let, let's no mistake about that. But uh, I'm getting pressure from a lot of people to be a district chief now, um, and so that's something I've to really start to look at, you know, like I said, my dad retired with 51 years as a chief. My grandfather was a chief. Um, I don't right now, as I sit here in your studio, I, I don't necessarily see fire chief on my horizon or even down the road. Um, but to be a chief officer now is really kind of starting to like, you know, I, I feel that that should be my next move in the fire service. Um, so it's, it's taking those classes, preparing myself to be a district chief, and, um, which I, you know, and pass on hopefully my, um, my beliefs, uh, my training, um, to, to the younger guys, to the next generation, that next tier, it's, it's making sure that, you know, Chris and Matt and LJ and, and Casey can be captains one day. And then Alex and the two Patricks and Chris can be operators and and so on and so on. It's passing all that down and and you know helping Neil out, who's who's the, the, now the number one man on the district chief's list. It, it's helping him, you know, surrounding, you know, surrounding myself with with people that want to be successful, and then also me surrounding, you know, those leaders to make them successful. And that's 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 what you can you know to pass that on is is to. You know, I'm no good if I don't pass on what I know. And that's something that, you know, teaching at our at our fire academy back home, you know, they we always ask, you know, like how many years you have on the job and and were you forced to be here or did you volunteer to be here? And it's like, oh, I was forced to be here. I, I'm forced to take this class. So okay, you know, part of our job as as senior members of the department and instructors is to make them wanna change that thought say you know what man these guys really put on a hell of a class for vehicle extrication and rope rescue and and swift water tech or whatever it is that we're doing i want to change their demeanor i want to change their mind and say and and we have uh for the most part guys come and, and thanked us a hundred times over like man we were a little hesitant for taking this class for to be in a home talk class and but you guys killed it, and uh, and that just that makes me feel good as a fire officer, as a firefighter in general, you know, and and being able to just pass that on, and because one day I'm not going to be there, I'm not going to be in that trench, I'm not going to be on that vehicle rescue scene or in that fire, but I have to 
make sure that I pass on to those men that you can push harder, you can push deeper, your body will allow it, and, you know, to make the right decisions. Um, and you know, like I said, if you're, if you're a young listener getting into the fire service and, you know, just don't ever lose sight of that, you know, you know, knowledge is, knowledge is key, especially on our job and get all the training and all, all of that as you can just soak it up. Don't ever be afraid to ask somebody, Hey man, what is, what does that do? Can you show me that no matter the simplest tool, whether it's a set of irons to your most complex paratech gold interstate kit, whatever it is, don't be afraid to ask. Um, sometimes when those guys ask me, I think they bite off more than they can chew because I love to teach and I love to talk, um, if you can't tell. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm again, I love the fire service. I'm very passionate about my job. I just want to pass that passion on to those that I get to serve with and those hopefully one day will serve with before I retire. Hey everyone, it's TJ here from Keep the Promise. As you know, this podcast is all about helping firefighters become more resilient and well-rounded so that they can be a force for good within their fire department and their community. But today I want to talk to you about something that's just as important, and that is supporting firefighters who are going through tough times. When one of our fellow firefighters is off work because they have to go to the Center for Excellence, they have to go to rehab, they have mental health issues, or they have other health issues, it really takes away their support system and it wreaks havoc on their finances and their family's finances. And many times these brothers and sisters are left to struggle alone away from their support system and the people who love them without the resources they need to recover. That's why I'm setting a bold new goal. And that is to reach 150 total patrons on Patreon so that we can start a fund to help firefighters and their families during these challenging times. And I need your help to make it happen. With your support on Patreon, we'll be able to provide financial assistance to firefighter families who are battling things like addiction, depression, and cancer. We're going to help alleviate the financial strain that can come with being away from the fire department so that our brothers and sisters can focus on healing and recovering. Now, reaching 150 total patrons is a big goal, but I believe that we can do it together. And when we do, we'll be able to make a real difference in the lives of those who serve and protect alongside us. So, if you're not already a patron, I invite you to join us today. Head over to joinkeepthepromise.com and sign up today. Again, that is joinkeepthepromise.com. And if you already are a patron, thank you so much for your support. You'll be receiving some exclusive rewards and perks as a way of saying thanks. Together, let's show our fellow firefighters that we've got their back just like they always have ours. Thank you for listening. Let's get started with the episode.